on the Talkback Show, on the radio, or whatever audiovisual device you choose to use, welcome to the GBC Podcast, where we talk about the Packers and our hometown of Green Bay. This is episode 13, created on April 20th, 2022. I'm John. I'm in Appleton, Wisconsin. Along with me are Jeff in Minnesota and Neil out on the East Coast. Say hello, gentlemen, and tell us what you're drinking. Hi, everyone. I am drinking a nice fruity beer from one of my favorite breweries, the Dewey Beer Company. It's a secret machine. They make a whole range of sours. This is the Cherry Cobbler Pie a la Mode. And hello, gentlemen. I'm having an Angel's Envy bourbon. All right, and I'm drinking a rum and Coke, and by Coke, I mean caffeine-free Pepsi this week because it's late and I don't want to be up all night. Uh, you can find us on YouTube and Twitter at Green Bay Chat and Facebook at the GBC Podcast, Green Bay Chat. And now just the audio is available on Spotify and Anchor by searching for Green Bay Chat. Tonight, we're going to be looking at some of our all-time favorite and least favorite Packer draft classes as we get ready for the NFL draft coming up next week. We have a guest contributor tonight, a Packers writer at Cheesehead TV, Packer Report 66, and Pack-A-Day podcast. His name is Dusty Evely. He'll be joining us shortly. And then, as usual, we'll have our Packer player of the past and our Packer history report. Neil, as much as I want to hear more about your Dewey Decimal beer, we're going to jump into our guest. We have Dusty Evely with us. Dusty is part of the Cheesehead TV and Pack-A-Day podcast and, and a great Packer guy. Even though he never lived in the great state of Wisconsin or Green Bay, we won't hold that against him. But Dusty, thanks for joining us. How are you tonight? I'm good, man. Yeah, thanks for thanks for asking me on, man. It's always, uh, always a good time to talk Packers. I've been uh, the draft. I'm a little uh, kind of out of the circuit, um, so it's good to always... Talk, come on and talk some football. So appreciate it, man. You're in the right spot because we, we have not done a mock draft either. We're going to talk about our all-time favorites. But, uh, Dusty, tell us how you got connected to Green Bay. Why, uh, why did you pick this team as, as the team to, to fall in love with? Luck of the draw, man. There's um, a picture of me. I think it's like a six-month-old baby with a Packers onesie. Uh, but I'm from, from the Detroit area initially, uh, just outside of Detroit. Uh, born in Rochester, lived in, I don't know, Romeo, Pontiac, uh, Oxford, uh, Lake Orion. Basically, if you draw like a half-hour circle outside of Detroit, I lived there at some point in my life. Um, and so all my major sports teams are Detroit. My my grandfather took my grandmother to a, uh, to a game. Um, Packers Lions back in the day I don't even what year this was and she she didn't like football she didn't want to go that day uh, and so out of spite she decided to cheer for the Packers um, bought a pennant brought it home to my dad my dad fell in love with the Packers and I was really close really close to being a Lions fan so just thank God that didn't happen uh, but yeah I've been Packers fan since birth I live in Kentucky we try to make it up. I got uh, two of my brothers are big fans. We got a friend of mine that's a big fan. So we usually try to make it up to at least one game a year. Um, we we I went up to the Lions home opener without them with some other friends this past year. Was going to make it to the Cincy game because that's close to me. Didn't make it to the Cincy game. We usually try to get up for one game a year. But yeah, been a been a fan my entire life. Been writing about them for the past uh, nine ten. So it's kind of taken it to a new level for me. But yeah, I've always been my first love football's my uh football's my sport that's my number one sport anyway so packers very high spot in my heart well next time you come to a packer game connect with us you know and and yes, let sir. me know you're definitely invited to the well the lot one tailgate party which is mm, going to be in yeah. lot nine this year i don't know if you've heard lot one is being to has been totally gutted i've seen the they're putting in now. underground parking uh so we're going to be south of the stadium in lot nine for the big diehard packer fan okay. tailgate party coming up this year Oh, and we forgot to ask Dusty, do you have a drink with you? I do. I do. Um, I picked up, I picked up drinking during the <laughs> pandemic. And also, Walk usually, little, yeah. yeah, seriously, man. Like who hasn't? Um, with doing podcasts, I get real nervous. So it's a way to relax is what I tell myself. So I've got, uh, I'm oh, drinking Makers 46. I live in Kentucky. It's always a bourbon or something. It's it's yep. one of the affordable Excellent. bourbons I like that I can always find. So it, it, this sounds like we need to get Dusty on more often because that's something yeah. that John and I both want right, to get John. into more. We certainly enjoyed that when we're in uh, Kentucky for the Bengals game. I've I got try. an Angel's Envy right here. Oh, there I, you go. There you go. I tried, I think, <laughs> six bourbons in Covington when we were there. Only and, six. Uh, huh? Though, yeah, well, we were only there two days, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's just pacing himself. Yeah. Uh, the, the the Weller is the one that I like yes. the best, which mm. I think is a local bourbon as well, right? Well, yeah, Weller was as Buffalo Trace. That used to be my go-to. Um, okay. Weller was a go-to before you could find it plastic bottles for like 20 bucks. And the secondary market got jacked up and you can't find it anymore. So like Weller Special Reserve 
was my go-to bourbon. And then everyone found out about it. Now you can't find a bottle for less than 80 unless you luck into a release day. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's yeah. a good one. I like Weller a lot. All right. Excellent. Tell us about your, your, your online footprint, so to speak. What are you podcasting? What are you associated with? Basically, Here's your, here's your free sales pitch. I don't know, general nonsense, I guess, probably. Um, <laughs> I got into writing, uh, like I said, about 10 years ago, and I was really interested in, um, I guess, the film side of it. The film stuff had just been released, and I was kind of curious about, like, it, more or less, it was receivers and, and DBs. It was, how, how did this man get open, essentially? Because all that stuff gets cut off on the broadcast. So I started doing kind of general film stuff, and that's gravitated to what I've been doing the past three to four years, I guess at this point has been a uh, general focus on the passing game. Um, so I try to every week uh, after the game, I kind of go through once that coach's stuff has been been released and I go through the passing game, I look at the concepts, what worked, what didn't. And then I kind of compile those at the end of the year. So I'm kind of in the middle of a series now where I'm looking at big picture, what they do in 2021, what worked, what didn't. Um, and I try to look at a little bit of everything, but the, the, the market, the writing market, the film market, all this stuff, it went from zero to 60 in the span of about three years. So the lane I decided to pick, so didn't, uh, wasn't doing the same thing as everyone else. And also doing something that still interested me is, is passing game. So if you ask anyone um, that knows me, it's typically, it's, it's passing game stuff. It's, it's concepts. And it's, um, that's a man who loves wide receivers is basically my, my footprint. <laughs> <I think. laughs> so then good, thing, good thing we're talking about the draft then. Right? Yeah, <laughs> man, listen, that's, I've got tons of crushes there. If you ask about the draft, I got tons of wide receiver crushes and like nothing else. <laughs> so you, you write for Cheesehead TV then, mm -hmm. correct? So yeah, are, are you, are you responsible for Nagler and Banky and all the goofy things that they say? God, no one's responsible for them, man. Uh, <laughs> no, I've been able to meet them a couple of times, which has been awesome. Uh, Banky's yeah. got a house right across from uh, uh, Lambo, so I've been there it's a right couple there times. Shadow. Yep. Yeah. Oh my. Oh man. Like just living the dream. But yeah, no, no one, no one controls those men. I, I take no responsibility for anything those guys say. <laughs> and then, where do people find you? Like, what? Uh, give us your your ads online twitter and yeah mainly else. just on twitter everything else is just basically i've got it locked down to you know sharing pictures of my children which no one really cares about uh so my, my main stuff is twitter just at dusty evely you can find me there so anything i write anything i put out of and try to do more uh videos I, I post all that stuff there to an annoying extent anytime i have something out i try to i push that real real hard because i'm proud of it um so yeah that's where you can find me and this there's a lot of downtime right now now we don't do mock drafts we jokingly said we gave him up for Lent. Neil Lent is over if you weren't paying attention. Uh, so that means we're going to make Neil, even if it means putting like six names in a hat and making him pick one out next week, we're going to make him pick, pick an, because you can't do worse than that, picking a name out of a hat no, as no. opposed to a mock draft. So how did you, you did one mock draft. You said, how did it turn out? It turned out really well. Um, I was really, I was proud of myself. I have, I have things I was going for, um, but it was also trying to see where the ball felt. I, I, <laughs> I joked I was going to trade all my picks to move up to one to get Chris Olave, and I did not do that. Uh, I decided not to do that. But yeah, I ended up, uh, I think, safety, uh, I think, Lewis seen out of out of Georgia uh, with 22. And then I traded back and still was able to pick up, I don't know, Christian Watson and and a couple of receivers that I kind of liked and some offensive line help. So I was I was happy with it. it was, I did a three-round mock. It took me about 10 minutes because I was really kind of looking at everything and trying to do it. <laughs> And then I posted it and what, okay, well, I'm never going to do that again. Uh, and then I will do another one next year. That's how <laughs> this are, works out. It's my cycle. <laughs> was that through uh, pro football focus? Did you use that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I do okay. draft network for a lot of kind of the reading stuff and she's at TV puts out a draft guide. So I do a lot of research there, just kind of reading to get prepared myself for kind of uh, what I'm looking forward to, but mock drafts PFF has a really nice interface and the ability to trade picks and all that stuff. It's really yeah. very smooth. So that, oh, that's, I think there's, there's a free version of it, right? That uh, you don't mm -hmm. have to be a subscriber to use. Yeah. And I think I just did three, but I think you can do the full seven and you control the speed and, and do the uh, uh, trade, the picks and everything. I just did the free version. It was really, really nice. John, John, we are not doing that. Let me just say that right now. So, <laughs> well, does, you does are he... not, you are not doing that. I've got some free time this weekend. I might, I might get Knock yourself out, John. So, so, Dusty, as long, as long as we're on the draft, how many, wide receiver and you're a wide receiver expert how many wide receivers do you think the Packers are going to take in the draft and how aggressively are they going to go after them 
it's tough to tell because with um with with Gutekunds, we only have a handful of drafts that we know for a fact he ran i mean there, there's there's rumors that he ran some of them in the later ted thompson years but what he did you know a few years ago is and you'll see this with other positions as well he has a tendency to spam those positions and not it's not all up front but he'll do them in kind of the mid rounds so if he, there's a position that they really want to hammer he'll take three or four guys and then the, the, you roll the dice and some of those guys pan out and some of them don't and the year uh, they they did uh, what mvs eq and and jamon moore yeah. and more didn't work out but the other two guys stuck um and so i, I have a feeling I have a feeling uh, something tells me they're going to dra- trade back out of 28 for some picks in the second and third round um, and just spam that position. So I, I think they're going to take, I'm going to say three or four is kind of what I'm feeling. I feel like three is like a lock. They're taking three guys lock, even with Sammy Watkins. I like the Watkins move, but that's, you know, that's, that's, uh, it's a veteran receiver and I like what he could give them, but he has a hard time staying healthy. You're not banking on that guy. So I'm thinking yeah. three to four guys is likely what they're hitting. And if they like a guy, I could see them trading up, um, but I, I, mm, unless they really, really fall in love with the guy, I don't see them giving up what it takes to move up in the first round. Like Drake London seems like a Packer, but I don't think they're going to trade up to like top 15 to get him. I, I guess what I, what I'm wondering then, what it sounds like you're saying is that you see the Packers picking for depth. You know, you look at, at Watkins, you uh, look at Rogers and you look at Lazard and you see that as our top three. And then you, whoever else can contribute on top of that is how you view the Packers going. Yeah, I view it, um, and, and this this year's fun. I guess every other draft is fun, but it, it's. Um, I look at the roles, uh, the roles those guys could fill, what 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 they need them to do on this on this offense. Because you don't have a guy that's like a do it all guy, or if you do, he's, he's going too high. And so you're looking at what can the what are these guys' skill sets that they can do immediately, and how can they impact? And there's a handful of those roles. They need like a it'd be really nice to have a possession receiver guy, a guy that can win immediately, and like you know the ten to fifteen yard range. I like Lazard, but like, that's not really his game. Well, it is kind of his game, but it's also not his game. You kind of have to scheme that dude open. Um, So you need that. It'd be nice to get a guy in space. And some of these are like, you're basically taking what a Devontae Adams do and you're getting two to three guys to fill that role. So a space guy, like the, 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 the RPO stuff that they ran all those bubble screens to, to Devontae, you need someone to do, to fill that role because you're going to want to run a lot of those. And you also need a speed guy because you lost that with MVS and there's zero speed on the team. And so when I look at, I kind of bucket those guys on that. I look at like Olave's possession guy. He's got the speed, but he can win immediately. Someone like Christian Watson is kind of the long speedster guy and someone like Khalil Shakur, if you want to get him earlier, the, you know, if he's still there, Garrett Wilson in the first, it's kind of your yak guy, you, the RPO, those bubble screens and stuff like that. And so I'm, I'm looking at more in terms of like, I'm not looking for one guy to do it all. It's what roles do they have a need for? What does this offense need to function? And then what guys fulfill those needs? And there's guys all scattered throughout the draft. So that's kind of, when I look at it, that's kind of how I look at it. You're looking at traits of specific guys and the buckets you can kind of fit them into. One of the things we're going to talk about tonight, we can jump into that too, is our, our all-time favorite draft class and, and even least favorite. And, and maybe what we'll do, Dusty, is we'll bring you back after the draft and we can talk about how this one yep. went com, you know, compared to expectations uh, just because yep. we know the Packers like to be players. I mean, you, you talk mm-hmm. about trading. They are not afraid to trade up. They're not afraid to trade down to get multiple picks. We know that the salary cap is an issue on, on how many players they can bring in, things like that. Um, but do you feel there's a lot of gambling going on in this one? Do you think that they're going to be wheeler dealers? I, I don't know. I like, I like <clears throat> the five slots that they're in for the top 100. I'd be content if they stayed where they were, but I don't think history shows that they're going to do yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, I think they will. I think, like you said, I think history shows they are going to move around and, and personally, I mean, just, just this draft and each draft is different. Um, there is some top end talent here, but a lot of it is like those, like that second, third round, there's a ton of guys there that, potentially could make a difference these again you kind of spam those those positions a little bit you could find depth guys you could find guys that could be immediate impact in a role and grow into something different so i mentioned earlier trading out of 28 like and that's one of the things one of the reasons i do at least one mock draft every year is they get a feel for it because i read this stuff and you read about the prospects but sometimes like the flow of the draft itself and not to say that pff is is going to 100 percent replicate what the draft is like but yeah. you get into those ebbs and flows and you see like okay you get to 22 who's at 22, who I like. And I got to 28 and I'm looking and going, there's no one here I like at 28, but there are five guys I like between the second and third rounds. If you trade back, get a couple of picks, which is again, I, I did that. And so I feel like now I am Brian Gutekunst. I am now GM <laughs> of the Packers. So he should also do this, but I think you could get uh, a an, an day one impact guy at 22 and then you could trade back from 28 
pick up some guys in the second and third round there and kind of get that. Cause it is, it's, again, it's not really, t- it, not a lot of top end guys, but there are a lot of immediate impact guys. So I could see them trading back out at 28, maybe even trading back again from the second, depending on how the board falls. And just, I, I mean, I, I guess that's the long answer. The short answer is, yeah, I think they're absolutely going to move. They've made comments about, don't be surprised about what happens in wide receiver room. If there's a guy they really like, if it's Drake London or Garrett Wilson, and that guy drops like 15 and they really like him, I wouldn't be shocked to see them trade up for a guy like that. But it feels more likely they'll probably stay put at 22, trade back from 28 and try to really spam some stuff in that second, third round there. But I, I, I'd be shocked if they do all their picks as they fall. I think they're, I think they're definitely trading around. So we'll, we'll talk about classes as a whole. I'm going to throw the question out to you. I'll give you my answer while you're thinking, but I'd say the last 20 years or however many years it's been, you, 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 did your research on is there a player that fell into a spot that you say man this was a great pick or this is my favorite pick in this time period and I'll answer that question because I'm wearing my jersey <laughs> there it is <laughs> ah. so Randall Cobb in 2011 so in in 2011 Randall Cobb if you remember had a lot of first round grades to him mm-hmm. and he had uh in 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 the voluminous mock drafts that were going on at the time uh, a, a lot of People had him picked in the first round. And I'm going to give a shout out to my good friend, Bill Johnson. Bill uh, was doing sports radio in Milwaukee at the time. He's since retired from sports talk. Uh, but his, he, he, only picked, he only picks the first round pick. And he had Randall Cobb as his guy. And I said, yeah, I like Cobb. I, I like him as well. And uh, I, Billy had him as his, you know, so the Packers should take Cobb in the first round. And they, and they don't. They get, you know, Derek Sherrod in the mm-hmm. first round with that 32nd pick. But then when number 64 comes around, and Randall Cobb was still available. And to get a guy at 64 with a ton of first round grades and to get that kind of drop, that was a major, I think that's probably the biggest steal, big move, major move that the Packers have had. And and certainly he has been, you talk about Green Bay guys, Randall Cobb has been a Green Bay guy. He has been perfect here. It was sad to see him away for a couple of years. I'm glad he's back. Um, That to me is probably one of my, most favorite individual players being picked in recent memory. Yeah. I mean, listen, man, you asked me what my online footprint was and I said, passing game. My, my t- second answer is, is Randall Cobb enthusiast. I'm, I'm very biased. Um, I'm, I graduated from UK. Uh, you know, I live in central Kentucky, I graduated from UK. So I was the same way. I would watch, um, I play softball with friends of mine and uh, draft is always on Thursday when the softball games are always on Thursdays and, and 11, I think they had, um, I think the first two, first three rounds were on Thursday because that's when they still had it. Like two, there was two days that right. wasn't to spread out. Yeah. Um, and so we got together after the softball game. We were watching on my parents' porch on my friend's phone while they're watching the draft. <laughs> and uh, I was doing the same thing. Like we all want to cob in the first, get cob in the first, get cob in the first. And Derek Sherrod. And then I was like, oh, man, that Sherrod's fine, I guess. And that didn't pan out for obvious reasons. But when they got him in the second, pandemonium man that was i mean and that was at the time we were thrilled because we i mean we watched him every saturday we'd seen him you know quarterback days at uk i i have a, a friend of mine from uk like stood up at his wedding like like we've like we know kind of the person he is we also know like what he could give that team and so to get him in the second round just over the moon yeah i don't i don't know that that there's many guys uh that i was more excited about than, than randall cobb in the second because once he once they didn't pick him in the first but that was it. The sun had set on the Randall Cobb era in Green Bay already. But uh, yeah, thrilled, thrilled by that pick. So I'm, I'm, All right. I'm stealing your answer. So we concur. <laughs> so th- 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 but this is, a fu- this is a funny thing about how perception is as far as drafts are concerned. Because looking at that 2011 draft, I mean, Derek, Derek Sherrod was, a, I would argue, go so far as to be a disaster. And if we'd picked yeah. Randall Cobb in the first round, it wouldn't have been any difference. I mean, that was, if he didn't have Randall Cobb, that would have been one of our worst drafts in the last 15 years. And there's still some bad. doozies in there. And, um, you know, this perception of, wow, we got this great deal for Cobb in the second. Um, when, if we had got him in the first, it, in the end, would not have made one bit of difference as far as our team is concerned. Mm-hmm. All right, yeah, no, also- I mean, that's something I always talk, I always think about, always talk about is this, um, it doesn't matter where the guy's drafted as soon as he's on the playing field. Like it doesn't matter. It's I, I was, I was down at AJ Hawk for a very long time. Like, well, if he was drafted in the fifth round, you'd be a big fan. Like, no, because his play is the same. If his play is the same. I don't care particularly where he's drafted. You, you got traits and there's certain upside that goes with that. But like, yeah, once you're on the field, it doesn't really matter. I, I'm, with, I'm with you. I looked at that 2011 draft and I was looking at the players and going, Holy crap, if it was for Cobb, that's an all-time just stinker of a draft right there. 
All right, Neil, so we're going to put you up first then, since you brought it up, all-time worst draft. You said 11 would have been bad. So, Neil, what is your pick for the all-time worst Packer draft class? I'm going to make you grab the notes. Neil, Neil's very good at putting together spreadsheets and, yes. and statistics, and, I, and so I expect... I, 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 I am in, I am indeed a scientist. So I mean, I've got a lot of choices <laughs> as far as our worst draft, and it's it's very difficult to overcome the 2015 draft. But I'm going to have to go with the the 1981 draft, in which with the sixth pick of the draft, we chose uh, Rich Campbell. Um, other picks we had we had uh, Gary Lewis, uh, Ray Stakovich, a punter in the third round, a <laughs> recurring theme as far as the Packers are concerned. Uh, in the Richard 70s Turner, and 80s. Yeah, there, yep. there, 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 there's nobody. I mean, as far as players who actually made an impact in the NFL, there is um, nobody who really made an impact at all in the NFL. The total AV for that entire draft for the Packers was 42. Um, there, there, we, we chose no talent. We chose it high and we chose it poorly throughout. And, I, you know, Rich- and, and, and specifically, as far as, you know, our, us, we are concerned, right? We were all 11 years old in that 1981 draft. I mean, this yeah. is like when you're in your prime of football interest. And it's like, oh, great. The Packers have a, have a quarterback in the first <laughs> round. We are going to be the team of the 80s because we drafted Rich Campbell. And, uh, well, that didn't really work out for us. Well, we, we eventually got it right by drafting a quarterback from California. So that's good. Yeah. But 50, Rich Campbell or, was not it. Yeah, did, did 14 Campbell years even- later play any games i don't even remember no. if he got on the i field. have the details because <laughs> i'm, I'm it, a detail yeah. guy usually yes so rich campbell drafted number sixth overall he appeared in total seven games for the packers didn't start any of them okay there were five future hall of famers still on the board after he was picked that year in 1981 here are his lifetime stats, and you have to dig for these. He is in seven games, he was 31 of 68 for 386 yards. That's a 45.59% completion percentage. His passer rating, 23.3. He had three touchdowns, nine interceptions, and seven sacks, and was gone within three years. He actually made it four years, but yeah, just a disaster of a quarterback. <laughs> five point five point seven yards per attempt over his entire career. And I, I can't even remember what number he wore. I'm scanning through quickly, and I'm not finding. Uh, just search the internet for worst Packer picks. It'll, it'll come right up. <laughs> so yeah, the the fact that he was the sixth overall pick, and like I said, the the five future Hall of Famers. Now none of them were quarterbacks. Granted, it was Ronnie Lott, Mike Singletary, Howie Long. Ricky Jackson and Russ Grimm, all wow. like cornerstone players, and they picked Rich. Campbell. And, and and we got nobody in that draft. There was not one good player that we chose in that draft for the Packers, including so, including again a punter in the third round. Yeah, no Don't punter quarterback. <laughs> punter quarterback from Michigan State. All right, Jeff. So, so then, what is your all time? Well, great minds think alike, and actually I had 81 (laughs) as well. But what made 81 particularly bad was that 80 was almost as bad. And the number one one pick by the Packers, number four overall, was one Mr. Bruce Clark, Mm -hmm. who never played for the Packers or in the NFL at all. He, um, yeah. So they he skipped had their, off to Canada, didn't he? He did, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He and he was not good in Canada either. Um, so between so eighty, their first round pick never even played for him. Number six or number four overall. Then they come back in eighty one with another stinker. So one thing that I was kind of putting together is it's team success, Packers success especially, and success in the draft does go hand in hand. And that's true with most, most teams because the Packers have pretty much always had a, you know, draft and develop philosophy, right? So they don't, you know, they've done a little bit in free agency, but generally stay away from that. So when they have one or multiple Turkey drafts or really terrible drafts, it really sets them back. Um, And so there's a couple of drafts that I have. So kind of the mixed ones, and the one, one I want to bring up, which is particularly relevant to this draft, was the last time the Packers picked a receiver in the first round. 
which was one Javon Walker, right, in 2002. So what was interesting about this, though, is they traded up mm -hmm. to pick him. So they, they were... So they sent the 28th pick, but also their 60th pick, their second round pick to Seattle. So it was, so they take Javon. He wasn't terrible. I mean, but he wasn't, he never he, really. He, he had one, he had one year that he was really, yeah. really, really good. Right. Well, then I mean, he pulled the, I don't want to play in Green Bay anymore, card, or You got to pay me more because he signed with Lee Steinberg. And, I mean, I, I was at the fourth and 26 game and the touchdown pass to Javon Walker in the fourth and 26 game early on. That was just like, yes, we are doing it. We are moving on. And uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I feel more disappointment than anger about Javon Walker, Walker because he was uh, a guy who absolutely had that potential, but didn't have it up here in the end. So, yeah. Jeff, I'm going to throw this out there just because I know my dad is listening that 1980 draft as well. In the second round, the Packers with the 34th overall pick took uh cornerback mark lee mark lee was <laughs> always one of my dad's favorite players and by favorite i mean not really uh he <laughs> i I, it, I i don't know how the only player that he's complained about more than mark lee in packer history would be jared bush so that's that, <laughs> right. throwing that out there for him all right dusty do you have a, a a least favorite draft class that you want to throw out there Man, I do. I'm going to go a little more modern. I, I do want to say that you guys both got like the tenor of your voice got sadder as you were talking about those, <laughs> as you were living like that moment of your childhood when like hope sprung eternal until the moment it didn't. Yes. Like I could, uh, I could hear like, it. Like happen. Neil said, we're, we were 11 years old in 1991. <laughs> yeah. We grew up with this. We, we know, we, we know had a front row seat. Yeah. We <laughs> this is good. This is it, man. This is it. This is the game changer. And then it wasn't. Um, 20 2015 i it, like that's that's too easy that's too easy um and i had the names in front of me and like two of those guys are still in the league i feel like like ty montgomery yeah, ty I think montgomery yeah, Hundley's yeah. still backing up somewhere if i'm not mistaken i think he was in there probably, pro probably fumbling somewhere too yeah oh yeah no he's no he's so. absolutely staring down his first read for a while somewhere um <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to take it back because the, and there's fewer picks here, but I'm going back to 04. Um, cause I remember mm -hmm. the, my excitement of 04, um, and Ahmad Carroll, who was a guy that like, I, I mean, freak athlete, like, well, if he hits man, like this guy's going to be something. And then like, every, I just remember the stories of like him having to practice in boxing gloves. So he wouldn't hold people. Cause he got called for so many <laughs> holding calls and all he would still hold people all the time, all the time. So he was one, the other guys on that list. It was, they didn't have a second round pick that year. It was Joey Thomas in the third, who was kind of a do it all, like kind of like a hybrid linebacker before hybrid linebackers were a thing that never panned out. I think he had one halfway decent year and then one decent year in Dallas, I think afterwards, if I'm mistaken. Uh, Donna Washington, BJ Sander in the third. We're going to, I decided the to pick this. BJ Sander. Was, draft. The, yep. yep. Another remember, punter. There's I was going to say, you guys talked about punter round. in the third. I had to take punter in the third. The yep. thing about BJ, BJ Sander was um, he punts left footed and that's tougher for guys to catch. It turns out that none, none of that mattered. None of that mattered. Um, he was terrible. And then it was Corey Williams and Scott Wells. I think Scott Wells, what had a, had a few, some decent years. Yep. So I almost didn't include it. I wanted to throw out any draft where I was like, there's usable players in there but they had very few picks. Scott Wells at in the seventh round is the only guy that didn't any halfway decent. Carroll, I think Carroll lasted a handful of years in the league, a ton of holding penalties. I think he got into a fight with a bar. I don't I think he had one season post Green Bay. He lasted no time at all. And then yeah, Sander in the third. I was, as soon as I saw that, I was like, I gotta, I gotta do this. Cause I remember, right. where am I feeling about Sander in the third? Wasn't great. Now, I took this in a different direction. This wasn't necessarily for me the worst, but it was my least favorite. And it's my least favorite because it is the last year that I really got into doing mock drafts, really cared about mock drafts, really looked at what I wanted Green Bay to do. Now, the year is 2007. And you're going to look at that and say, but John, they got James Jones in the third round there. And they got Mason Crosby in the sixth round and Desmond Bishop also in the sixth round. That, that 2007 wasn't a terrible draft. And you're right. But it was that year in 2007 that the Packers, in my opinion, needed another safety. I say another safety because we had a young stud at that time named Nick Collins. Collins was two years in the league. They just couldn't find a good compliment to Nick. Now, Neil will tell you that they had guys that he liked, like Atari Bigby back there. Charlie Pepper was back there as well. Um, Mark Juan Manuel was in his last year in Green Bay and on his way out. And there was a guy that I really, really liked out of the University of Texas 
named Michael Griffin. And he was a strong safety in college and he was projected to go right in the middle teens. The Packers had the 16th overall pick that year. And I studied this. I said, nobody else needs a safety. Michael Griffin, Griffin, he's going to fall to number 16. He's going to be there when Green Bay needs him. This is going to solidify that defensive backfield. We're, we're going to have two hard hitting guys back there that are just going to, you know, knock the shit out of everybody that comes within 10 feet of them. And, and watching that draft and it's like, okay, nobody's taking him. Nobody's taking him. Nobody's taking him. And I still remember I was driving around. I was, I think I was driving to the errands, maybe the grocery store or something, but I was in the vehicle and I'm driving down the road and, and the 15th selection was made. And I was like, oh, he's on the board. And I'm just like literally dancing and singing in the car. We're going to get Michael Griffin. And, and going along, going along and listening to the local radio. I think it was still, you know, WDUZ I had on at the time uh, that, that, that they announced it and they come in and they announced that the Packers drafted the defensive tackle out of Tennessee, Justin Harrell. <laughs> and you want to talk about going to sadness. <laughs> I think I pulled over to the side of the road and said, what <laughs> what <laughs> well three picks later griffin goes to tennessee he played nine spectacular years in tennessee he was on the all rookie team he had two pro bowls he was a second team all pro one year just a spectacular career he played his last year uh, in carolina i think would have been a terrific asset uh it, trying to picture him in that defensive backfield at, in super bowl 45 you know, even though Nick Collins carried that, that backfield was great, but that was the guy that I really, really wanted. And that's why 2007 is my least favorite draft because I just, well, say what, you know, say what you will about Justin Harrell and everything, but just failing to get that caliber player in a position that they John, need. So John, I, I, I put, so I had a couple of drafts that I considered my what if drafts. And so first of all, I, I completely agree with 2004. That was on my you know, border of the worst yeah. draft, certainly. The 2007 draft to me is a what if draft because, um, right, we were 13 and three, went to the NFC championship game that year. And we were just so close from going to the Super Bowl. And if, you know, we had done something like trade a fourth round or fifth round pick for Randy Moss or not fail on our first round pick of Justin Harrell or a second round pick of Brandon Jackson, we might've had the pieces that would have made the difference in that season. And um, I, you know, have eternal bitterness about that season. And the fact that we fundamentally failed in that entire draft uh, really hurts as far as thinking about what happened at the end of the Favre era and, and you know, where we started leading into yeah. as far as the Aaron Rodgers era. So I've got another kind of, I don't want to say what if, but this is a draft where Packers had two first round picks. I'll take you back to 1990 for mm -hmm. this one. So after the 89 debacle, obviously with um, Mandridge and, you know, so, okay, Packers, Lindy and Fonte trying to build something. So they've got two first round picks, 18 and 19. So they go out, First pick, Tony Bennett. Mm -hmm. Okay, not the singer, the <laughs> linebacker, Tony Bennett. So, okay, right after that, then they came to Minnesota. They picked Daryl Thompson. Darrell. Um, that didn't work. Or Darrell Thompson. Yes, thank you. Um, so that didn't work out so well. However, uh -huh. the second round turned out a little better. Because that's 40, when Leroy Butler 48th was picked. overall pick, yep. Yeah. So, but with two, you know, so again, they had two first round picks. They didn't, they kept them obviously. And they, they, but neither one of those players made really any kind of an impact at all. But they've got a Hall of Famer in Leroy Butler. So Tony, Tony was solid for a few years, I thought. But yeah, uh, I mean, at the time, I think at the time that was considered a successful draft. Cause yeah, Tony Bennett, Darrell Thompson, Leroy Butler, Jackie Harris at tight end. And then Bryce Pop at linebacker, and then even uh, Lester Archambault at, uh, in the seventh yeah. round. And Lester kind of stuck around for a couple of years as well. And then I want to throw out there that uh, uh, in the ninth round from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, the Packers drafted quarterback Kirk Baumgartner, the pride of Colby, Wisconsin. <laughs> he, Kirk, Kirk had a, few, a cup of coffee in Packer camp that year, which was a, a big yeah. <laughs> day in a, bi a big day in pointer history. That's my school, Dusty, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, I, I, yeah. you know, you, you, get, you got excited. I, I put two and two together there. All right. Well, thank you. 
So let's let's take a look at uh, some of our favorites. Then we we looked at the least favorites, and we'll, we'll we'll defer to our guests because we said that if 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 we have a favorite and it gets chosen, we got to pick a different favorite. So no, none of us get to choose the same year twice. So Dusty, you're you're the guest of honor. Oh, what man. was your favorite All draft right. class that you looked at? I'm gonna throw out a year here, and I'm gonna see if anyone's disappointed to see if I stole your year before you get to it. Um, <laughs> I was going to go. We'd be happy. Home. It's a happy year. I mean, why would it's, a, it's, it's going to no, make us right. think that? Oh man, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> there will be more happiness. I'm going to take it back, and I, this is partly player and partly kind of John. What you did, kind of my with you with your least favorite, kind of how happy I was and the point in my life I was when when this occurred. The year is 1995. Mm-hmm. I was uh, I was 15 years old. It was in high school. This is the year before they won the Super Bowl. I did not know they were going to win the Super Bowl, obviously. But I've been a Packer fan my whole life. Uh, you know, watched a bunch of games. They weren't great. Things are kind of starting to come up a little bit. Things are starting to come up. And then 95 hits. 95. Still, and this is like my biggest, if he didn't hurt his back, what happens to him? Craig Newsom at the at one. And Craig mm-hmm. Newsom's to this day, one of my all-time favorite Packers. Just what he did in that Super Bowl run. And I think the year after that, before he got injured, like he just... He had so many great moments in such a short amount of time. Like he was a lockdown coming into the league. So big Craig Newsom guy. I'm not going to read everyone off here, but William Henderson in the third, loved William Henderson, uh, Antonio Freeman in the third as well. And then there's just an all Adam Timmerman in the seventh and then all time lunatic Travis Jervy in the fifth, just, <laughs> and just a, just, I mean, there's the stories of the lion. Everyone knows I'm a reading story about it. He had braces and he didn't like them. So he ripped them off with pliers. Like that's the guy you want on special teams. So like that 95 year and that, that primed them for that Super Bowl run there just, and where I was and I was, you know, paying attention to the draft a little more at that point as well. So 95, you know, I was, I was almost one Oh five um, just for obvious reasons, just, you know, the, you had Roger uh, Rogers and uh, um, uh, Collins, Collins and that one and a couple other ones there as well, but 95, just where I was, who they took, how they ended up painting out. Uh, that's that's an all-timer for me right there. Excellent. So, d- full disclosure, we all have <laughs> we're all <laughs> like looking at these. We're, we're all following we're along in our like, oh, media yeah. guide Bible. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> now, I mean the, the the 95 draft. I mean, to me, the Packers beating San Francisco in the 95 uh, divisional round, that is what changed Packers history as far as our lives are concerned. And obviously Craig Newsom was central as far as us scoring that first touchdown and, you know, giving, giving the punch to the jaw of the defending Super Bowl champ. So I have an eternal love for, for Craig Newsom as well. So Neil, 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 do you want to share your favorite? Go go straight into your favorite draft, Neil. John, I'm going to defer on the best draft of all time. Okay. um, Which is for Packers history, I think is an obvious one. I'm going to go into the 1992 draft as the Packers Uh, my favorite Packers draft. And so, you know, you've got uh, Robert talking again about this, you know, who are the players players that propelled us to a team that Mm -hmm. won a Super Bowl? You've got Robert Brooks, you've got Edgar Bennett, you've got Mark Chimura, you've got backup Ty Detmer, not that he played a lot. T-Buck, not so much as the fifth pick of the draft, (laughs) but of course we (laughs) traded the 17th pick in the draft to get Brett Favre. And to me, trading the 17th pick of the draft for Favre makes that our best draft other than the 1958 draft. And 58 was one of those years that I was probably going to look at as well, Neil. So I'll I'll kind of peek at that one here. Uh, So 1958 was a very good year. Dan Curry at center came out first. Uh, Jim Taylor and and really Neil, I I was fully expecting fifty eight to be your year just just for you to say nineteen fifty eight. Fifty eight fifty eight is clearly the best Packers draft of all time. But <laughs> just I just <laughs> just say Nitschke and and walk away, okay? <laughs> Nitschke, yeah. Nitschke, Kramer, Taylor, three NFL Hall of Famers in one draft. You in can't the beat first thirty nine picks. You, you cannot beat that as a as a draft. So that's too obvious. And, and those drafts of the 50s, we we keep talking about Jack Finisi and we keep dropping his name and, and we got to dedicate an episode, episode to him sooner or later because he did such a wonderful job scouting for the Packers in the 50s and those drafts of the 50s. Jeff, I'm jumping in. I'm taking my favorite year and I'm going to take 1952 uh, huh? as a favorite year. So 1952 in the first round uh, out of Kentucky, Dusty, they took quarterback Babe Perilli. Do you, mm-hmm. do you remember that name, Babe Perilli yeah. out of Kentucky? Sure, sure. Yeah, they All made right. a movie went, about him, The Pig, right? He went, <laughs> Babe, yes, Babe <laughs> in the City, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Perilli went fourth overall. Then a player that should be in the Hall of Fame went 15th overall in the second round, Neil, out of Rice University, 
Billy Houghton, one of the great ends receivers of the Packers 50 squad. And, and, and uh, I went on a kick a few years ago that I thought Bobby Dillon should be in the Packer or in the, in the pro football hall of fame. He got in on that century class a couple of years ago. Well, the third overall pick out of the university of Texas, the Hawk, because he had one eye, Bobby Dillon was taken uh, 28th overall. But I think if we went on a crusade, Neil, I think Billy Houghton is the next guy that we have to go on a crusade for uh, to get in the Hall of Fame. So those three guys right there at the top, Carilli, Houghton, and Dillon, Dave Hanner in the fifth round, and then just a bunch of other guys that kind of filled spots. But those top three picks and Bobby Dillon being my uh, current all-time favorite Packer player because it, he's long time been, uh, being a trivia guy, my favorite Packer trivia question being, who holds the Packers record, all-time franchise record for most career interceptions? And up until a couple of years ago, people forgot Bobby Dillon. And, 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 and the things that he did, 52 interceptions in 96 games on teams that, what, won 14 of those 96 games. And, uh, and he did it all, like I said, with a, with a glass size. So 52 is my favorite draft class. Jeff, you're up. So I had, um, I have three, 58 being the obvious one with the the three, you know, Hall of Famers. So 2005, again, with Rodgers and Nick Collins before he, you know, had his his terrible injury. I mean, he was. The Hall of Fame trajectory. Yeah, exactly. So you've got essentially two Hall of Famers in in that, you know, 2005. So I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the, I'm going to stay in the fifties. Actually, I'm going to go with 56. All right. So two Hall of Fame picks there. Of course, you got Forrest Gregg, of course. And then with, uh, not to outdo Tom Brady, but with the 200th <laughs> pick in, in 1956, it was the 17th round, one Bartlett Star. Brian Bartlett Star. Yes. So, um, but what, so I started, as I was going through kind of all the, again, in the Packers media guide has all the draft picks. One thing started to, I like saw a pattern emerge here. So I started um, and what that pattern was is, and I mentioned it kind of at the top of the, the, this uh, podcast as well, that drafting successfully begets championships basically. So there were in the fifties. And again, this is to John's point too, of, of how they were drafting. Well, first of all, a lot of these were top picks. So you've got to have a really crappy team, right? To get really good top picks, unfortunately. However, as you stockpile the right franchise. So the Packers between 1952 and 1963 picked 11 Hall of Famers in the draft. In 1960, there were two Hall of Famers that were added. One, Willie Davis from Cleveland. They signed kind of as the free agent of the time. And an undrafted rookie free agent, some guy by the name of Willie Wood. And so it was, it was a combination of starting with Bobby Dillon in 52, Jim Ringo in 53. These are all Hall of Famers. Forrest Gregg and Bart Starr, 56. Paul Horning, 57. Jim Taylor, Ray Nischke, Jerry Kramer in 58. And then, like I said, the 60 draft, they weren't drafted, but Willie Davis and Willie Wood. Then 61, Herb Adderley. And 63, Dave Robinson oh my God, what a run, right? And so then in Packers history, there's kind of a lull, <laughs> shall we say, a, a big lull. So then the next Hall of Famer that was drafted wasn't until James Lofton in 78, and he had good years in Green Bay until he didn't, right? And, um, and then it was Ron Wolf, Favre, the Favre trade and the Reggie White free agent, then there was another gap. Now it's Rogers. So it's just, it's interesting how things kind of go cyclically. Well, I mean, yeah, I I think we go back to Dusty's draft in 95. So that was certainly on my list of potential drafts. I talked about the 92 draft, the 93 draft, you know, Wayne Simmons, George Teague, Santana Dotson, uh, Doug Evans, right? It's building those pieces that are all going to go together. They don't all have to be hall of famers. They have to contribute. And if you can get a couple really good solid picks, the, the, well, you mentioned 56 and, and, too. 56 even had uh, that was Skaronsky, right? And he was yeah, uh, like stalwart yeah. left tackle from for years, like not a Hall of Famer, but at least right. one All Pro, I think, or Pro Bowl or it, something. Yeah, like he had one All Pro. He was 
he was kind of overshadowed by the right tackle that uh, Forrest Gregg fellow. Mm-hmm. But yes, Skaronski is kind of <laughs> like the forgotten player. Yeah. And the thing, the thing about that is, is people will misremember. And I'm going to pick on my friend Bill Johnson again because he misremembers. He always puts Forrest Gregg on the left side. No, Gregg was on the right side, and and Skaronski yeah. held that blind side. And then one other draft that has this sort of building is the 2000 draft where you've got Bubba Franks, Chad Clifton, Niall Diggs, KGB, and Mark Tauscher all in one draft. Again, none of them Hall of Famers, but, you know, if you want to build a winning football team, you've got to have those parts. With the Hall of Fame quarterback already in place. Right, exactly. I mean, and, you know... Honestly, that's, you know, you know, we go back to the nut punching element of, you know, essentially all of the Mike, Mark, Mike Sherman drafts and how we killed ourselves with terrible drafts with Mike Sherman. And, um, you know, we're good enough to win the NFC North, but not have the pieces to go further. And, um, but yeah, there were just those drafts that you just built everything up and it's just beautiful looking back and seeing those drafts. And I'll throw this out there for, for people listening. Um, we intentionally avoided 1989. 1989 is too easy. <laughs> to pick as a worst draft. And, and Jeff, you've got those numbers as well. Uh, five, four Hall of Famers in the top five picks. The only one yeah, that we wasn't. Yeah, we the one that wasn't. <laughs> went second overall to Green Bay, Tony Manbridge. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give a special, uh, you know, it's, I guess we've gone back to nut punching. I'm going to give a special <laughs> shout out to uh, Brent Fullwood in the 1987 draft. Yeah. the fourth overall pick as a running back that really did not do very much for us. And, and I guess it was kind of the, you have to go to the bottom to rise, right? I mean, the Packers throughout the seventies and eighties kind of were pretty awful, but it was like those late eighties where like all kinds, whatever could go wrong, did go wrong with mm-hmm. the front office and everything. And thank God for, for Bob Harlan said, yep, I'm going to pick Ron Wolf and the Phoenix rose from the ashes because they, it was pretty ashy. <laughs> Dusty, you pointed out earlier too. You know, like I said, growing up in Green Bay, yeah, we're very good at looking back and and <laughs> punching ourselves in the nuts over things that went wrong over the years. Uh, but it, it's been we've been blessed though as well. That's what yeah. I keep coming back to. If you had told me in 1985, hey John, uh, your team is going to have 30 years of uh, superior play with uh, two Hall of Fame quarterbacks and two Super Bowl victories, uh, how do you feel about that? I would have said, sign me up. Yeah. And 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 these people that want to you know, say, but oh, Green Bay's only get, had two Super Bowls. And Super Bowls are not easy to win. <laughs> and yeah. hey, well, and also, are- you, the, you know, the people also diminish the joy of like watching a good team from week yes. to week. Like if you watch, I think of like, like baseball, I'm a big baseball guy as well. Um, I'm a Tigers guy. So the life has not been good for me lately. And for the bulk <laughs> of my life, the, the, yeah. the, the, they had a 10 year run there, but they, they had not been good for the bulk of my life. I think of like the Marlins, like if you ask a Marlins fan, listen, was those two world series was that enough to cover up like watching in misery and baseball you expound that it's 162 games every single day of every year when they're not winning a world series like you can say in your mind that it does and having those two super bowls in the bag that certainly helps and that's awesome because you don't always point to those but like man like i feel like a like a browns fan like you're watching miserable football like it doesn't matter they could have won a super bowl three years ago that doesn't that doesn't matter now when like they can be miserable to watch. So it's just that yeah. that's why I try to remind myself is just the, the, the joy of just every week. Listen, man, they might not win, but it's at least going to be something entertaining and they at least have a chance to win. Like there's teams that, you know, you don't go into every single game. We don't have a chance to win for like years. <laughs> that's not well, fun. <laughs> and, and that's why. So when we had Bengal Jim on and just sharing kind of in Cincinnati's joy, that their Super Bowl run and just kind of the buzz and the electricity. Mm-hmm. And yeah, okay, they ended up losing, which was unfortunate, you know, for them. But I mean, just kind of the whole buildup and, you know, because it had been, you know, decades since they had been, you know, since the 80s, obviously, 81 and 88 when they were, you know, went and still lost. But it was just this buzz. It was like, okay, we're good. We've got a great quarterback. We've got an exciting team and we just want to get behind them and we like the winning. Yeah. And so right. we're after uh, after 30 years of, of, of misery and, and unfortunate things, <laughs> unfortunate things like the Carson Palmer injury. But yeah, yeah to have you're right, Dustin, you, you it's it's nice to have that one or two. But watching a good team every week also is, you know, so the these draft expect- classes of the last 30 years, the management, the general, you know, the general managers that we've had uh, to, to just make this a strong team and a good product on the, the field. stewards every, that they've yeah. been. <laughs> Yeah. 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 To have that faith. I mean, it'd be nice to have 10, like it'd be nice to have 10 Super Bowls in the bag. Like, I, that'd be cool. But yeah, it's, it's, 
trust that like they're not they're they're likely not going to completely biff the draft that every move they make is not going to be terrible and that they're going they're going to be competitive and at least entertaining like that's that's not nothing because a lot of fans don't have that on a year-to-year basis like that's you get sometimes you get flash in the pan stuff and then you just Oh, guess what? We're terrible again. <laughs> yeah, you're back nice to having status a status quo. Well, yeah, just yeah. Bas- basically puts us to where we were with Don Mikowski, right? Where we had that yeah. one great year and we hoped it was going to continue on, but we knew through our history that it was not going to continue on. And thankfully we got Ron Wolf and Mike Holmgren and Brett yeah. Favre, and it did actually continue on at that point. But yeah, well, even, you know, Lynn Dickey's what, 90 or 83 campaign, you know, is that was magical. Yeah. And, but I mean, then, it, it was then, one of those, that was it. <laughs> it was the flash, you know, and then it was back to the, not so much. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, we've, we've, it's nice to be winning. I mean, we're not the Patriots. We haven't, you know, won the, you know, won the Super Bowls as we discussed, but there's still a consistency and there's still an excitement. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody likes a winner, but it's just, you know, kind of expecting that plus for the city of green Bay being, you know, from there and seeing what this, little team has done and has become you know the institution really that it's become you know and and like I said folks like yourself that you know what you don't have to be from Wisconsin to mm-hmm. like the team right you, you can mm-hmm. participate and, and be a part of that you know so again this whole Dallas Cowboys is America's team shit you know I, I'll <laughs> just no it's it's the Packers because it, it's just you know, and it goes back to, like I said, your grandparents, and it, it's a historic because they have that history in the 20s, in the 30s, in the 40s. They were amazing. You know, we've done these podcasts have taught us a lot of history. You know, we, we were there. I mean, we weren't alive then, but, you know, <laughs> parents and grandparents grew up in Green Bay. And like, so the reason why I'm wearing the Don Hudson jersey is like, oh my God, you know, he was amazing, you know, back when as the forward pass was just mm-hmm. being introduced, basically, right? And so that literally was, you know, six miles or whatever it is to, from my parents' house to East, you know, East uh, or city stadium, you know, six, eight miles. It's amazing. Yeah. When you have these pockets too. I mean, I've, I, last year I decided I wanted to dig into some historical plays and try to look at them from like a schematic angle. And I really tried to get into some of the history of those as well. Like you learn so much about like, not just, I mean, I, I, I did a series on the sweep and there's so many, aspects of the sweep historically and the guys involved and some of them forgotten and kind of what all went into that and the different Mm -hmm. stories of the specific things and the variations like that was exciting but there's also like I don't know a random concept or random play from like 1993 that like you don't really think about but like the kind of the history and like just those these pockets of history that you just get throughout the Packers and you can go back I mean to the beginning of (laughs) football literally to the that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah i mean the legacy series is great i got the, on the shelf behind me you can't really see it about that the cliff crystal um the greatest story in sports book that was oh, released yeah. and like just some just of the stories in it I just got that up as well God, it's Feels incredible it's yeah. so good but yeah there's so much so much history there and some of it's kind of forgotten and, and oh, it's, it's so good it looks so pretty too it's so pretty. yeah <laughs> taking a look ahead dusty before we let you go we're a week away from the nfl draft Tell everybody where can they tune in if they want mock drafts, they want pre-draft talk. Is there a draft, is there a draft night party that's going to be live? What are you going to be involved in over the next week? <laughs> there will be. I'm not sure if I'm going to be on it or not. Uh, Cheese Head TV every <laughs> year does one. I know uh, Nagler and Benke host that. And so they're on for the entire, you know, at least for, I think for all weekend. So I'll probably pop in. I usually pop in around day three or something. Um, but that first round, they always have cool. I mean, it's, it's, She's had writers, so a lot of people I love and respect and, and people that have written there. So like Maggie Loney and Perry Goldstein are usually regulars. Andy Herman will pop in over there. Ross Oglin will pop in over there. But they get, I mean, one year, I think it was a year or two ago, Bakhtiari was there for a while um, talking about, you know, what the, his his draft stuff experience and and just they're kind of just chatting, shooting the shit with Bakhtiari. And you get all of these. Uh, so they'll get these random players. And I have no idea who's going to be there. But there's at least day one, someone will be on there. So the Cheesehead, uh, Cheesehead draft one's always fun. If, if I'm not on it, I try to watch it. Now, my night one, I just got a text from a friend. Um, I'm going over to his porch. And he just said uh, bourbon <laughs> and steak on the porch. I was like, okay, Perfect. yes, that's, yes. And this guy... Winner. 
this guy gets into bourbon and so it's always like some like basically a flight of like bourbon i can't find anywhere else that we have at his house so that's that's what i will be doing on draft night uh but yeah the that's, that's a good way to spend stuff. draft night you know, so are we looking great, at man. looking at a road trip next week or you know, <laughs> like, Woo, hey. come on down brother come on down <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Cheesehead TV is good. The, the good time. I'll pop in there at some point. But even you know, even if I'm not there, you know, God forbid you watch when I'm not there. Um, good, <laughs> good, stable of guests, and uh, you know, Benky and Nagler get get a little uh, punchy after a while uh, because they're on for a while by day two and day three. Uh, so it, it's it results in some fun. Sounds good, Dusty. Thanks for your time. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah, Thank thanks you so much. for joining us. Really Been great. appreciate it. And one of the draft classes we didn't talk about was. 1938 and specifically the first round pick of 1938 but he is our Packer player of the past Neil yes we've got uh number 17 there on the screen that's uh obviously not Devontae Adams it's Cecil Isbell um he was a the first round pick the seventh overall pick for the Packers in the 1938 draft he was a uh, native of Houston went to Purdue and the Packers picked him um, as somebody who's going to be a quarterback to uh, be able to be the complement to their running game. Somebody who both had running and passing capabilities. Uh, the 1938 draft had two NFL Hall of Famers, um, Alex uh, Wojciechowicz, who was picked by Detroit, one pick before Cecil Lisbon and Frank Kennard, who was picked by the Brooklyn Dodgers in the third round. Um, anyway, the, uh, the you know, Cecil Lisbon was specifically chosen to provide some compliment. You'll recall the Packers won the NFL championship in 1936, and they thought that they needed to have somebody who was going to be able to uh, extend the field a little bit, uh, both with his legs and with his arms. And so um, specifically teamed up with Arnie, Ar Arnie Herber as far as a running quarterback tandem. Um, and specifically in the first year, they made the NFC championship game where they lost to the New York Giants 23-17. Uh, but that certainly was one of those things that gave the Packers, again, a taste of uh, the champ. They had won in 36, obviously. Obviously, um, it gave them a taste. Um, and so in 1939, the Packers went on to win the N NFC Championship. That game was in Milwaukee, as we've talked about previously, a 27-0 win over the Giants. Um, and specifically, Cecil Isbell threw a touchdown pass in that game. But you know, those were his first two years in the league. And so he's starting to sort of build up his abilities as the quarterback. And it was really only in the early 40s that he really started to come into his own. And so in 1941, his fourth year in the league, he set an NFL record for 1,479 passing yards. Yes, that was the NFL record for passing in 1941. Obviously helps to throw to Don Hudson. Uh, 15 touchdowns led the league with touchdown passes. 1942, he set a new NFL record with 24 touchdown passes um, and also set an NFL record with 2,021 passing yards and seven and a half yards per attempt. Um, you know, both le leading the league in touchdowns, yards per attempt, um, yards per game in 41 and 42. That 1942 year was a uh, tough year for the Packers because they went eight, two and one, uh, but they lost to the Bears who went 11 and 0 in the West. They lost both of their games against the Bears. Both the game, the first of those two games, the Packers went out and got a lead early, um, but the Bears defense, the Mon Monsters, the Midway just took control. They had a 42 yard fumble return, a 54 yard interception return. The Packers threw the ball. They threw 30 times in that, in that game for, versus 32 rushes. Um, they really couldn't make, they made more progress passing than running, but two touchdowns, four interceptions sort of doomed them. The second game was a 38-7 uh, blowout. But you might think, okay, they, they, you know, they had a championship a couple of years ago. They're now positioned, you know, they were a little bit behind the Bears, but they've got something to build on. 1942 being Cecil Isbell's fifth season in the league, and then he retired. He had set the league record for uh, touchdown passes. Uh, for touchdown yards, he had a streak of 23 consecutive touchdown passes, an NFL streak of consecutive touchdown passes that was not broken until Johnny Unitas in 1957, not broken as a Packers record until Brett Favre did it in 2003. Um, and I think that Cecil Isbell sits in terms of one of the big what ifs as far as Packers history is concerned. Um, somebody who retired at his prime, something Cecil Isbell said that he regrets having retired. Um, the 1943 season, the Packers ended up only one game behind the Bears, did not obviously make the championship. They did win the championship in 44, uh, but not because of their quarterbacking skill. And so um, there's a lot to be said that if Cecil Isbell continues, the Packers might have had an even greater dynasty during the Don Hudson years. And um, He's somebody certainly that I think uh, merits a strong uh, thought as far as Packers history, certainly associated with the 39 championship team, but there's very much a what if associated with Cecil Isbell. Oh, 
couple other uh, factoids to to uh, follow up uh, with that, Neil. He's the uh, he was an all decade quarterback in the 1930s, and he's the only all decade quarterback not in Canton, Ohio. Uh, another weird thing uh, about, or strange, unusual, is that he had a, a shoulder injury, and he literally had a chain under his pads to keep his shoulder from dislocating. Ooh. Sports medicine so, was not the same thing then as it is now. <laughs> nope. And then, uh, John, perhaps you know this trivia question. Oh, boy. Um, so in 1942, as Neil said, he passed for 24 TDs. This was a Packer record until when and who broke it? After that, I would guess Lynn Dickey in 83. Very good. Yep. With hey, 32. Right. And, with 32. But, um, Lynn needed five more games. Five. So I wanted to just a, a few uh, factoids about the draft. The first NFL draft um, was February 8th, 1936. It was at uh, Philadelphia's Ritz-Carlton Hotel. There was a pool of 90 players. There was 10 teams at the time in the NFL. There were nine rounds. There were 81 players drafted. Only 24 ended up playing in the NFL. Wow. So not a huge percentage. The reason why the draft even came about is there was a um, the Philadelphia Eagles co-owner, a gentleman by the name of Burt Bell, he proposed the draft because Philadelphia at the time sucked. And so they could not get players. So he said, okay, we kind of have to level the playing field that it wasn't fair. It was a disadvantage to try and sign good players to Philadelphia. So um, they, um, during the 1935 league meetings, he proposed that the draft was to level the playing field and to make sure each franchise remained financially viable. The owners at the time voted unanimously to adopt his proposal. And again, in 1936, um, the first draft was held. Now, um, so interestingly enough, the Philadelphia Eagles did have the first pick of the first draft, and they drafted a gentleman by the name of Jay Berwanger. He was a halfback, um, and he was, the Philadelphia traded his rights to the bears but this gentleman never played in the nfl so trivia question for you john what uh -oh. is jay berwinger also known as to win the first of uh i don't know the uh, cricket championship no, no idea <laughs> no neil any ideas no idea um it's a big deal in college football did he win the heisman yes Wow. He won, he won the first Heisman. Didn't know that. I thought that was kind of interesting. So, so and he, he doesn't play at all. He sort of set the precedent for Heisman winners sticking yeah, in the exactly. NFL, right? Yeah. There's not that many Heisman Trophy winners that have played yeah, well in the NFL. So another trivia question. So the Packers in 1936 drafted seventh. Who did they choose? Any ideas? Uh, I put my book down. Well, that, you said 1937, 7th overall? Uh, uh, so 1936, the Packers drafted guard Russ Letlow. And he okay. actually did play for the Packers. Yep. I was say, remember when the draft first started getting televised, like in the early 80s, and they had the like just the banquet room in the hotel, and every team had their own table, and they had the, the helmet. The helmet the phone. How, how <laughs> bad did you want to have a helmet phone? <laughs> yes. The helmet phone. Yes, your team's helmet phone it just oh, absolutely like the receiver just kind of was the curved part of the helmet yeah. it just yes yeah so jeff i've got a trivia question for you as long as you've gone to heisman trophy sure. winners what was the last school that john heisman coached at uh notre dame uh no rice a fine school down in texas named rice university <laughs> coaching ad for four years in the 1920s last place he coached nice excellent okay and in the world's largest trivia contest in Stevens Point last week, or what is it, 10 days ago now? I don't know. I've lost all track of time. Uh, one of the last sports questions, I think it was almost the second or third last question of the contest, was a Packer-related question about uh, the team on a West Coast swing. They got uh, filmed by a, a Hollywood film crew, and they were doing different drills and things like that. And someone challenged a player who they said had small hands. They challenged him to throw a football uh, 50 yards at a 
pane of glass being hung at the goalpost. And he threw the ball and on the first take and shattered the glass and his name was Arnie Herber. And a lot of teams got that one correct. And uh, as did we, we finished 25th place out of 300 teams. It was a good weekend for trivia. Well, thanks to our guest tonight, Dusty Evely, for sitting in with us. And we'll get some information out on the website. You can always get more information on the GBC podcast at Green Bay Chat on Twitter and on Facebook at the GBC podcast Green Bay Chat. We also will now have the audio available, the audio only on Spotify and Anchor by searching for Green Bay Chat. So you don't have to look at us. That's right. <laughs> so may you fully appreciate the magnitude of your impending good fortune. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Good night.